Hey, y'all. Thank you for coming. Can you hear me okay in the back? All good? Okay, cool. So I am super excited to introduce you to two best-selling romance novelists today. We have with us the delightful Adriana Herrera. She was born and raised in the Caribbean, and she loves writing stories about people who look and sound like her people, getting unapologetic, happy endings. She's an outspoken advocate for diversity in romance and is one of the co-creators of the Queer Romance POC Collective. Her book, A Caribbean Heiress in Paris, came out earlier this year, and On the Hustle comes out next month. I would also like to intro, yeah, come on out, come on. I would also like to introduce you to Sarah McLean. She's the author of many historical romance novels. She is also a leading advocate for romance as a genre, and she is the co-host of the weekly romance podcast, Faded Mates. Her newest book is Heartbreaker. It is the second book in the Hell's Bell series. Sarah, come on out. <laughs> Welcome, you two. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. Hi. This is my favorite book festival of the whole country. <laughs> so I'm going to put y'all in the audience on the spot. How many of you have already had a chance to read these two in their newest books? Okay, so that's a pretty solid show of hands. So for those of the people out there who haven't read these books yet, I would love for y'all to just give us sort of like the, you know, long elevator pitch version maybe. Adriana, do you want to start? Sure. So, A Korean Heiress in Paris is the first book in the Las Leonas series, and it's set in 1889 at the Paris World's Fair. And the first book is with Lucelana Hizbansan, who is a rum heiress from the Dominican Republic who comes to Paris to try and sell her rum in European markets, but she's not having a lot of success doing it. And coincidentally, there is a whiskey distiller there who's also Scottish and also an earl, and yes. happens to be super hot. And so it hot. just so happens that he needs to get married to get something, and she needs to get married to get something. And what so happened? they get married, <laughs> and then something happens. <laughs> Oh my God, it's such a great book. It's so much fun. I'm really excited to talk to both of you about the research process with these books because they're obviously so rooted in fact, even though they are fiction. But first, Sarah, tell us about Heartbreaker. Heartbreaker is the second book in my Hell's Bells series, which follows a Victorian era girl gang um, <laughs> that is just interested in kicking ass and taking names and justifiably punching bad men in the face. And also doing other things with good men. <laughs> and it involves a road trip from London to Scotland to stop a wedding or possibly make sure the wedding happens. It's, uh, there's a lot. There are highway women and tavern keepers and bad guys and bar brawls and also kissing. <laughs> Smooching, as you like to Smooching. say. Smooching. True story. When I was reading the arc, I texted Sarah after I read the prologue, and I was like, Sarah McLean, how dare you? <laughs> well, it's not really spoiling if I, spo if I tell you what happens in the prologue. Yeah, let's right? go. Like, Do it. Uh, the prologue involves a wedding, the heroine's wedding, which does not go through because there's a gang war that interrupts it. So <laughs> if that's your vibe, it's mine too. <laughs> So, Sarah, I interviewed you on Nerdette almost a year ago for Bombshell when that came out, which is the first book in this series. And we talked a little bit about the idea of historical fiction then. And you talked about how uh, you don't think you've ever used something in a book that you couldn't find at least some sort of evidence of in history. I imagine the same is true for Caribbean heiress in Paris. I would love to hear from both of you about what that research process is like, just because it seems to me like so much of it comes down to the fact that certain sorts of people were allowed to write the histories that we are all familiar with in school. And so we may be indignant or surprised to learn about a lot of this stuff, but it's like, no, there's, it's there, it exists. Adriana, do you want to start? Sure. So I actually was going to Paris um, like a few years ago and I was doing just research. I'm from the Dominican Republic. So whenever I travel somewhere, I'll just like research Dominican wherever I'm going, just in case something's <laughs> happening that's awesome with Dominican people in that place. I love so, that. 
I, I just Googled Dominicans in Paris, and I found an article from a while ago from a Dominican newspaper saying that the first time that the DR had been at a Paris exposition was in 1889. And then I was like, what? I didn't know that. Oh, and then they also said that King Leopold from Belgium had snubbed our pavilion because our president at that time had borrowed money and not paid it back. Oh, so. <laughs> amazing. I was like, I must know more. So I ended up finding that this was the Exposition Universelle, which is where the Eiffel Tower was Great. debuted, and it was the centennial of the revolution, and the French basically invited for the first time 13 Latin countries for the first time as independent nations, not mm. as colonies. And so about 6,000 Latin presenters came. They all built pavilions. It was called the Sun Alley, um, and it was all the pavilions from Latin America were like around the Eiffel Tower. And there was just like a ton of information about all these Lat Latinx countries and people being there. And about 32 million people came to the fair that year. So it was basically like the first global event in world history, like the, it, in modern history that's recorded. So I was like, this is perfect. So yeah. pretty much a lot of like what I, ba what I have as historical detail is there. And I also wanted to do a lot um, in terms of women in distilling, yes. because there's just yeah. not, I think we, we think of spirits as something that is a man's world. Mm -hmm. And in mm -hmm. fact, a lot of the, the big innovation that was done in distilling was done by women. So those were my two big researchy things. That's really cool. It does seem like to learn about the Exposition Universelle is like, oh yeah, we for sure need to set like, you could set n a number of books just at that event alone, you know? Yeah, like 40 countries were there. Yeah, that's amazing. So uh, we got, we collected listener question, or attendee questions ahead of time, and Anne wanted to know something along these lines, too, which was what was the most surprising bit of history that you discovered while writing? Sarah, what do you think? Um, well, this series, like I said, like I said to you last year, there, I mean, I've never had an idea that I couldn't, I couldn't prove could have possibly existed. Um, but this series has been particularly fun because the Hells Bells, which is the gang <laughs> that I'm, the girl gang that I'm writing, is sort of loosely based on an existing uh, crime ring called the 40 Elephants, which uh, is a hundred, spent, spanned 100 years from the mid 1900s to the, um, I'm sorry, from the mid 19th century to the mid 20th century, um, and was entirely peopled by women. Uh, it was the largest shoplifting ring ever in the history of the United Kingdom. Um, and it began in the Victorian era with a bunch of women who had been born into less privilege than, I mean, when you're writing about England in the 19th century, there's a lot of privilege there. Um, but uh, many, many of these women were born south of the river. Um, and they decided that if they weren't going to be given opportunity to have privilege, they were going to take it. And the way that they were going to take it was to essentially um, manipulate or, or feed into the societal expectation that women are soft and mm -hmm. um, fragile. Mm -hmm. And so thinking about the, the mid-1800s, the mid um, we're talking about dresses that have lots of big bustles, right? <laughs> lots of space <laughs> under there. And instead of petticoats, the 40 elephants designed specially designed cages underneath their petticoats, big pockets. The original thanks, it has pockets here. <laughs> they would walk, this was also the heyday of the um, department store. They would walk through the front door of the department store and then just collect leather goods <laughs> and jewelry and fur and shove them into their skirts, into the giant cages beneath. And no one would bother them because women are too fragile, right? Mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't walk up to a woman and talk to her. <laughs> so that was fine. And then they'd walk out the side door and offload all of their stolen goods to a massive gang of women who would then disappear into London. And they terrified shopkeepers. They ended up spreading themselves like far beyond the city limits. Um, and I don't recommend turning to a life of crime. <laughs> um, but they were awesome. And it ended, there's a gr there are great books about them now. Um, but the final queen of the 40 elephants died in the 1960s, and my favorite piece of information is that she died and was buried in a $6,000 dress that was stolen from Herod's. <laughs> Bless. 
Oh my God, that makes me so happy. So uh, we also talked about the idea of writing historical fiction that feels very much of this moment and speaks to issues in this moment. And you know, I think what you're just talking about, the idea of sort of taking advantage of low expectations is certainly a thing that a lot of us may or may not do as we're expressing our feminism in 2022. I think about you and you know, highlighting the work of female distillers in history. I was wondering if each of you could talk a little bit more about you know, themes from these books that you think really speak to the current moment that we are in. What do you think? It's a fun moment, guys. <laughs> it's so fun. <laughs> I mean, the themes, look, romance has always been, it's the, the work of romance, it's a, it's a very domestic genre. And when I say that, I don't mean like it's about home. I mean, it's about um, who we are as readers, who we are as people. And um, its work has always been to sort of show us the world that we live in. And in the words of Jane Ann Krentz, who is you know, one of, one of our, our biggest writers, you know, show us, genre moves us toward living our best selves, right? Being our best selves. Um, and so I think when we are in a position like we are now mm -hmm. in the world, what romance can do is show us how we fight, how we stand strong, how we find community, how we find like-minded people, how we support each other. Um, and I, I think that's what both of our books do. I mean, I think about the found family and the sisterhood in Adriana's books. Right, Las Leonas. And I mean, in mine now. that really speaks to it, yeah. And I feel like we all need it. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think part of, for me, um, writing Las Leonas was also kind of going to a place in time where you don't usually get yes. a gaze that's, like, from someone that, like, lives in a body like mine. And so, to me, I think it's part, part of what is needed in this moment is, I think, experiences that speak to something different than what has been the dominant culture, right? So I think just being able to write a book set in that time where like the active protagonist in that book was a woman of color trying to move through the world and falling in love with a man who had a self-awareness to know that yes. the aristocracy was not the center of a world, but also had to learn allyship in a different mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think all of these things, right, are important in this moment because I think what's something that's critical now is, like, being able to, like, not center yourself in every narrative and learn how to, like, take in other experiences. Yeah. Which it feels like historical... I mean, Adriana would be able to speak to this probably better because she writes contemporaries as well. Right, but right. I do want to ask Historicals about really have a special... There's, a, there's something very special about being able to write historical during mm -hmm. a time like this when we can strip away so much of what we live day to day and tell a story that is set within a, a kind of fantasy world. Uh, the world building makes it possible to really throw all of what we're dealing with now, today, in 2022, into stark relief by mm -hmm. setting it in the 19th century. Yeah, I mean, I think there's just like a lot more space to explore things that right now just feel very volatile. Mm -hmm. um, the book, the second book in Las Leonas is a lesbian romance. So it's two women and it's, um, <laughs> yeah, they're both Latinas. And I just, I just turned it in yesterday. Um, and Congratulations. Yeah. And it's, it's all about like a lot of what I did was exploring and like kind of digging into like lesbian culture and like, in the 1880s in Paris, which let me tell oh. you was a great freaking time. <laughs> and, and just thinking about, right, like the ability that I have to really explore like bisexuality and like what it feels like for two Latina women to come together and things like that without having to like touch upon all the different other things that are like kind of like hanging over us right now and kind of just go to like that experience of finding your place and your people. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. just, yeah. And also I feel like historical is like the Broadway of romance where like <laughs> you could just like have dancing and like people like breaking into song. It's so extra, <laughs> which is its joy. <laughs> so we got a really thoughtful question from Heather who said, old school historical romance is known for the frequent use of rape as a plotline leading to love. 
Your books have pulled historical romance into the 21st century and created stories and heroes we can celebrate as good modern men. How do you balance historical truth, including historical sub subjugation of women, with modern tastes to create work that feels authentic enough as to not be completely an anachronistic, but also swoon-worthy enough for modern readers? Adriana, I think you balance this really well, especially with your extremely privileged character. Like, so much about the story you told was, like, the inherent oppression that is a dukedom in the late 1800s in Europe. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought, listen, I un, like I love historical romance, so I had to put an Earl in there or a Duke, and I had to, I wanted yeah. to do like the conventions of romance, like the balls and the carriages and like making out of the Eiffel Tower. And so, <laughs> but to me as a Eight woman plus. of color, I had to confront, like face the his, like the vestiges of colonialism. Right, I grew right. up in Santo Domingo, which was literally the place where the first slave rebellion happened, where like the transatlantic slave trade came to. And so I could not speak to that when my heroine is from that place. Mm -hmm. But I think part of it was like being able to tell that story without having to burden my heroine with teaching him oh, you know, there's like right. colonies, like there's like slavery happened over there. Like, so- And you I made think, a lot of money off of it. Right, and so yeah. I think to me, it's, it's, I think part of what we do with historical romance is that we can explore like consciousness. Like there are moments where like things come into the consciousness of a culture, of a society. And I think with historical, because it is set at another time, you can explore like the prickly parts of that without um, kind of like having to get like lost in like all the things you need to be watching out for and like in a contemporary, for example. Mm -hmm. it's, I think it's just like, again, I think it's just like why it's important to be writing from a lot of different experiences, people with a lot of different experiences because I think that will act, like gives a different perspective yeah, totally. Well, and Sarah, kind of, I mean, there's a dynamic at play in your new one that I thought was really nice, too, just around the idea of, like, wanting a partner who isn't a knight in shining armor, but who also will still help you. And even balancing that, where it's like, no, I don't want you to, like, save me from the position I'm in, because actually I've built a pretty great situation for myself, and sometimes that may involve danger, but I can handle it. Right, I mean, uh, romance, I mean, gosh, the happily ever after for me, and I think for so many people, is about partnership and parity. Mm. Um, it's about having somebody in your corner who understands that, who is there if you need them, but who also understands you're going to be okay by mm. yourself. And I think for me, romance novels are so much they are, they are as much about finding love with another person or several other people than as they are finding love within yourself, right? Finding love for yourself, finding, you know, family, community, and love. You can have all of it. It's okay, right? And I think um, that is something that I learned from those old school romances because ultimately in those old school romances, the hero ultimately does have to mm -hmm. let the heroine be strong. And now I just think it's 50 years later and we can tell a different kind of story but still honor those, the bones of it. Mm -hmm. So Adriana, what is, you write modern too. What's the, like, are you using different muscles? Is it fun to kind of be able to go back and forth? What's it like doing both? Um, I mean, Historical is harder <laughs> because you have to kind of like, Fair enough. the world building is a lot more intense. And sure. of course there's also like language and all that stuff. Mm. And, and there are, like I can't like use vernacular. Like I would, with, with contemporary, I can just like write how I speak in my <laughs> regular life. And with historical not, I just, I actually have written a historical and a contemporary this year. And right. leaving the historical headspace to go into the contemporary was wild times, um, <laughs> but I think, I, I think I do use different muscles because the research is so different. And, and I love reading history and 
just personally being able to find all these different like hidden things in history that I never knew about. Like for example, that you know, Latin people were at the 1889 World's Fair, like 6,000 strong, and we were there and we won medals and we had artists and we had poets. And all those things to me are like healing in a way even because you can, you can play, I can place myself and my history in, in, in those spaces where I haven't been. And contemporary just is, it feels different, but the themes I think in my writing are always similar. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Sarah, have you ever thought about writing contemporary? I have. I have actually written a contemporary. Oh, you have. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, excuse me. Wait, wait. wait. Um, I, I wrote a contemporary right at the very beginning of the pandemic while oh, cool. chaos was raining and I just needed to like get out of my own head. I wrote a, a short, a novella called A Duke Worth Falling For. Sorry. <laughs> There are a lot of dukes in my life. Um, a, duke, a duke worth falling for. And it was set, you know, in an idyllic British countryside, an American heroine and a, and a British sort of secret duke. Um, and that was really fun and totally different. And, mm. um, and it, I did it because I wanted to get out of mm -hmm. the space that I was in. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's hard not to think about when you walk through the world as, an, as a novelist, especially a romance novelist, and you hear lots and lots of people tell you their stories of mm. like love and found love and lost love and missed love, and you know, it's hard not to think like, oh, I would, I would love to write that book, but hmm. historical is where my heart is. So I'd love to talk a little more about romance as a genre in general, um, because there are a lot of rules, which I think is really interesting, and I think it's, I think it creates a formula that can be really pleasurable to read because we know what to expect and we can find it really engaging and there are always fun twists on the tropes. But I would love to just chat a little bit about, I don't know, maybe what some of your favorite tropes are. Do you have a favorite or is it fun to mix it up? I definitely have favorites. <laughs> <clears throat> what are they? We all do. Um, I think my personal is probably Faded Mates, Insta Love. Mm -hmm. and, and that can have there's many variations to it but i i love a meet cute where like the heroine shows up and the hero's entire brain shorts out nothing <laughs> makes sense after that his whole life is in shambles and then go <laughs> that's adorable what about you my favorite trope is enemies to lovers yeah, it's so because like the banter is uh, annoyingly giant shoulders. Oh, like, why is that man so time. hot? <laughs> She's so annoyed by how tall he is. It's just like, oh, this is gonna be good. <laughs> um, I also I have a sort of I have a, a a version of enemies to lovers that I love the most, which will surprise no one who is a Sarah McLean reader, which is childhood friends to adult enemies to lovers. <laughs> which I have written more than once and will continue to do. <laughs> Can no I, apologies. <laughs> Can I put y'all audience in the, on the spot again? Has everyone here read a romance novel? I'm just really curious. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I don't have to sell y'all on the genre. You're all in. That's what I figured. I mean, I don't it's know. It's just full of like joy. Like yes. Life is too short to read depressing books all the yeah. time. Yes, yes. yes. Like, look around the world. It's depressing. <laughs> here we, we're here for you. Romance Give is here for you. Give yourself a gift of a happy ending. Well, yeah, so let's talk about the happy ending because I do think this is really fascinating. Well, that's the rule, right? You right. said there are rules. Yeah. That's, and there's really only one that's rule. It. It's just the happy ending. Yep. And yep. does that mean they get together? Like, is there a happy ending where she's like, yeah, no, we're, I, I'm cool just by myself? No, no, no. <laughs> That's another genre. No. That's a different panel. <laughs> yes. So uh, let's talk about that, though, because I think it's really fascinating. And I think there is a sweetness and a reliability to it because you know it's going to happen, but you're not sure exactly how. That has to be fun to write. Yeah. It, I mean, I think, I mean, all genre fiction, right? Like, all genre fiction has its conventions. Re you're reading a cozy mystery. You know, there's going to be a dead body in the beginning of the book. Mm -hmm. And by the end of the books, you're going to find out who did it. Mm -hmm. And for romance, two people are going to meet. 
and they're most likely not gonna like each other. And then by the end of the book, they are going to be together and they're gonna be exactly the person that the other person needed yeah. in the beginning of the book. Yeah. And so what is great about romance is that you, you, you can do that with every book and every single book is gonna deliver that thing in a different way. And if it's a really good romance, you're gonna be certain there's no way that they can actually be together until <laughs> the very end. <laughs> I mean, it's that breathlessness of new love, mm -hmm. right, of, of discovery. And that's not just romance. I mean, there is a breathlessness to discovery of love in all forms, right? There is mm -hmm. a, that excitement of, I learned, you know, I have a new hobby that I really love. Mm -hmm. I have a new television show that I really love. I have There's a friend a, I have crush. a new friend, yeah. right? I, yeah. want to, I wish I could hang out with that person more. Totally. And then that sort of breathlessness is just dialed up to 11 in romance novels. Mm. And the hope is that we give you, we sort of have this covenant with the reader that mm -hmm. I talk about all the time that is like, I promise you, and my books definitely are not an easy journey. They are gonna take you up here. They are gonna drop you to the ground hard. You are gonna break, I hope. There will be tears. But at the end, you are gonna have that great immense joy of falling in love and I like it. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I think about this a lot for myself, writing books with Afro-Latina women, with queer women. It's that in romance, it's one of the safest places to explore experiences outside of your own. Mm. Read about a culture, read about a background, about a life experience, a history that's not your own, because you know everything's gonna be fine. Mm. You can throw yourself into those two people and know no one's gonna die, at least not those two, some other people might die. <laughs> and they'll deserve it. And they, exactly, they will that's be different. a bad guy. And, and learn just... and experience love and emotion and culture and all these other things through that couple mm -hmm. safely. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and not even thinking about like desire and sexuality and all these other things that romance explores and gives people the ability to like learn about and think about for their own life and experience. Mm -hmm. Like that's like a whole other magical part of romance. Well, and there's just such an emotional vulnerability to it all, too, which is such a refreshing, you know, things can be so jaded these days that to spend time in a book where people may not express themselves perfectly all the time, but the idea is that they are going to get there. And as you say, you know, the fact that they are going to be who each other needed in the beginning, like there is a real beauty to that, you know? So how do you, you two are friends in real life. How did you meet each other? At a book event, ah, uh, Avi. Adriana came up to me after a book event and told me the plot of her first romance novel. And I was like, oh my God, send it to me the second it's oh. done. And you sent it to me that night. I and love that, that. The rest is history. And how long ago was that? Five years ago. Okay. When did that book come out? And yeah, when I first met you two in real life earlier today, you talked about how you were helping each other with story ideas earlier this morning, right? Yes. So you like, do you, you read each other's drafts? It seems, I mean, partly I'm fascinating because it seems like the romance writing community is such a supportive space. It really is. It is, it is. I mean, honestly, like romance people are the best people. <laughs> Yeah. Also, events with romance readers yes, are way more I fun than events without. Too. Yeah. That's People so think funny. like K-pop fans are the best, but like truly, like they're great. <laughs> but romance fans, <laughs> the best. The best thing is doing a doing a romance event for the first time at a bookstore that's never had a romance event. And they're just like, and it looks like this, and usually it gets a little like spicy and. <laughs> The booksellers are always like, who are you people? <laughs> <laughs> well, Sarah, when I talked to you last year, you told me, is it 10 to 12 books a month that romance readers That's read? That's the last piece of research that I, I've amazing. seen is that romance readers read on average 10 to 12 books a month. Y'all are ravenous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I it's, mean, I've had years of a book a day. Oh, yeah. That's so I mean, amazing. Definitely. Raise your hand if you read a book a day. No, oh my God. Easily. Wow. 
Three or four. Three or four. Hi. That's amazing. <laughs> I recognize you from TikTok. <laughs> Do you think that's partly why romance as a genre is evolving so quickly? Like, it just seems so much more socially aware than a lot of other genres these days. Romance, not me, but romance writers in general are so fast that it's yes. impossible for the genre not to be shifting. You know, mm. one of the other things that we didn't talk about when we, we were talking about historicals is the books aren't, I mean, they're not written in a vacuum about 1890, right? They're yes. written, they're written in 2022. Right. So we're writing for all of you about what's happening in the world and the books as they go by, I mean, especially how many books are you putting out this year? Two full novels and then two novellas. So. Yeah. yeah, that's a lot in one year. So if you think about it, you know, Adriana's been writing, you know, you, she's reflecting the world as it is constantly changing, which is yeah. like every day it feels like something new. Yeah. In four books this year. So they're, that's why the, the genre moves so yeah. fast. So that reminds me of a question we got from Aaron, which is that romance writers have taken strong stands on social media about current social and political issues. How has the current climate affected your writing and how do you manage your online presence? Uh, I mean, it's like, the, I'll say this, like, like, for example, Roe v. Wade was hard, hard. And I, like, even I had plans for, like, my books that were specifically going to speak to reproductive justice. And then I was like, okay, so I have to amp this to, like, a 57. Mm. Like, I was going to do it, like, at a 10. It's gotta, and then, and I mean, it, it's an artist's job to reflect the times, right? So we have to go in with the consciousness that we are writing these books for people who are experiencing the same pain and the same struggle with what is happening in the world that we are. Mm -hmm. And like there has to be a resonance, right? Like I, I don't have the luxury as a person who lives in this body to like ignore what's happening around the world and like present a world where there's like only people who think and look a certain way. And so it is our job to like put that in into the books and in a way, and, and the hard part, like, and that's why romance authors are superheroes, is that we have to deliver all that and then give you sexy and then give you great mm. sex scenes and give you a happily ever after and make you root for the, the <laughs> protagonist and all of that. Yeah. Plus like having some resonance so that if these the people that are reading our books feel seen and feel connected to themes and things that are happening in their own lives. Mm. Yeah, I mean, ro romance, the modern romance, right, that what we think of as, as the modern romance was born on the back, in 1972, alongside Roe, right? Alongside uh, the, right at the same time as the Equal Rights Amendment was, was being, you know, debated for the first time um, and, and, passed over, right? And and part of what romance has done for, did for those early years was show us a lot of the difficult struggle that women in particular were having at the time. I mean, we you talked about early romances depicting rape, mm. and the truth is that, you know, marital rape wasn't illegal in most states. Right you know, for many, many years until the 80s, yeah. in a lot of cases, um, women in 1972 couldn't, couldn't open bank accounts or carry credit cards if, if they were married. They had to be, you know, on their, their husband's bank accounts. And these kinds of things were represented over and over in romance with these heroes, these domineering heroes being basically broken and rebuilt over the course of the book. And I think a lot, I mean, I have a podcast, you know, with... Jen Prokop, uh, it's called Faded Mates. We talk all the time about what is it going to look like now? Because we're back, at, we're in it again, right? Mm -hmm. It's happened. We have to fight from the start again. And romance was there then, and I hope it will continue to be there. I know we will be there. So going forward, what's something that you're really excited about seeing shift or evolve more in the romance space? That's new another question from Jordan, by the way, just to give them credit. Thanks, Jordan. Um, <laughs> new readers are, mm. it's like, 
it is, something is up in romance. Like we are, TikTok is happening. <laughs> People are buying romance novels all over the New York Times bestseller list, the USA bestseller list. Every bookstore, you know, everywhere is carrying romance novels now. That did not, that is new. Mm. That, there were many, many independent booksellers that never touched a romance novel until the last couple of years. And these are largely brand new readers. Like, are there people here who just started reading romance since the beginning of the pandemic? Oh, yeah. You, okay. you don't have to be ashamed awesome, of yourself. Awesome. No, welcome. I'm Glad really excited. You. And, you know, I really love it. And I hope that, I hope that more and more people are going to find, you know, books that represent, you know, us and how, how we are, how we feel in the world around us and how we can fight and um, move forward that way. Yeah, I mean, I think, it's exciting to see, I, mean, I, I'm in a lot of fandoms, like I, I love the fandoms and fan fiction. I think one of the, in, the great things that has hap that have happened in the last couple of years is that publishing has discovered or realized the power of romance readers as a fandom. Mm. And I think that's something that I didn't think was quite how publishing saw romance readers. Like, you, you can be a fan, or you can be part of a fandom, and when you're part of a fandom, you just, you just don't want the books. You want to be enveloped in that world, and I think romance readers have that much passion, mm -hmm. and we have so many new readers. My hope is that all those new readers that have come into the genre will start reaching for books that are di more diverse, that there's more interest and more curiosity around books that are written about people and by people who are queer, people of color, and that, that excites me. Mm -hmm. So speaking of TikTok, Stacy had a question, which was, what's your opinion on the book talk effect and the new trend toward advertising books solely based on tropes versus the content of the story? So this is a conversation that's going around, this trope conversation, mm. and I don't actually have, I, I think it's fine. I mean, we've been selling books, I've been selling books with only one bed for, you know, <laughs> 12 years. And the reason why is because y'all like it. And so do I, right? Um, Heartbreaker has exclusively only one bed, like all the way through. <laughs> um, true. So uh, I don't think, I mean, I, I appreciate the concern is that we're, you know, we're making the books, I don't know, derivative or, I don't know, I mean, but it, it doesn't feel that way to me. It feels like marketing. I well, mean, it's, it's a shorthand. I, still think, complex and I think it's like the tropes are shorthand for right. romance readers so yeah. that they know what to expect about the dynamics that are going to happen mm -hmm. in the book. And so to me, it's an, I mean, in my social media, when I'm doing promo for my books, like I put all my tropes in because it's an easy way for the reader to be aware of what's, what kind of vibe is going to be happening mm -hmm. between the protagonists. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't have any particular like intense feelings about this. Also, if you're reading a book a day, you're like, <laughs> today I want to read about faded mates. Yeah, and like go find your thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, it seems to me too. I like if it comes from a place of enthusiasm, then like let's just be enthusiastic about yeah. it, right? Yeah. I don't have any intense feelings about it. Fair enough. Sorry. <laughs> no, I think that's, I think you answered the question. So I would love to talk to you all a little bit about craft and when it, you know, uh, how much do y'all plot out before you start writing? I imagine having the framework of things in a series is probably pretty helpful because you at least have a sense of where you want to go with things and some of the worlds and rules already exist. Like, are you storyboarding? How is that, how does that work? <laughs> that reaction was so good. I, half a second. <laughs> I, I, I outline, but I'm also a pantser, and pantser's just someone kind of that is more like an intuitive writer, so you kind of like just go with whatever's happening. And I do outline, but I, I have this, I've had the same editor for like, all of my traditionally published books. And she knows that whenever I send her a synopsis, it's like a suggestion of what the book is gonna be, be like. Sarah and I were just having a conversation. She's like, how do you write a synopsis when you're more like an intuitive writer? And I'm like, you lie, Sarah. That is what you do. <laughs> because, and the light was like, oh, that's allowed? You lie. Because I, 
I outline because I have a sense for what I think I want happening, but mm -hmm. I, out, I typically, when in my first draft process, I'll, I'll do like 25 outlines because I'll mm. do a couple chapters and then I have like a whole different sense for the book and then I'll quickly do that outline and then four chapters later, I'll do that. So it's a very chaotic process, <laughs> but, um, but I it do, works for you. It I works mean, for me and I do a lot of pre-planning and thinking, I have to percolate. Okay. the book for a long time and the characters and get a sense of it before I actually write, which I tell my partner, I am not procrastinating, I am working in my head. Yeah. That's amazing, I love that. Uh, we actually collected questions ahead of time, so I think we'll stick with those. Oh, sorry about that. We're talking about romance as a genre. So Sarah, what about for you? How much do you plot out ahead of time? I don't plot. I don't plot at all. Okay. And I, um, what I do is- You go along for the I ride. sort of fill the well. I do the same thing. I do a lot of like reading and thinking. Um, I often have, I pitch a series. When I pitch my series, I pitch them as a full series to my editor. So oh, cool. I, um, so for example, Hell's Bells is a four book series. I knew instantly, I knew when I pitched it who each of the heroines would be. You all now, if you've read the books, know mm -hmm. who each of the heroines will be. And, um, and I knew when I started, like, who each of the heroes would be. Okay. You don't know that. But the... Um, <laughs> um, we probably have some guesses for guesses, some of some them. Guesses. There's a big question mark uh -huh. but, um, that is not a question mark for me. But uh, the, um, I love it. But, and so usually when I, when I pitch a series, I sort of know the scope of the series and I know the overarching thing that I want to do with the series. Like, what's mm -hmm. the theme of this series going to be, um, et cetera. But I can't start a book until I know uh, the end of the book. And what I mean by that is not obviously the happily ever after, which is a given, but um, <laughs> the sort of bleakest part of the book mm. and the like big set piece, which usually leads into a pretty big set piece ending for me. And until I know what that is, I can't actually begin the book. And I don't plot though, so then I'm just mm. writing in the darkness toward that. But you ending. have a destination. I know the destination. Yeah. Interesting. And so the best way I can explain it is to say that um, I go, I go from I I start the book, and it's like tomorrow morning if you woke up in your house and you had to go to the grocery store, but all the roads that you would use to get to the grocery store are not available to you. So like, you just have to figure out so how like, to- So good luck getting yeah, to the Yeah, you store. know the general direction. Um, and that's what it's like, and it's that's terrible. Kind of <laughs> you shouldn't do it this way. Um, because usually what happens is I get to about 70,000 words in a manuscript. My, book, my books are about 100,000 words long. I get about 70,000 words in, and I think to myself, oh, that's what's happening here. Oh. And I have to go all the way back to the beginning and figure it out. But um, wow, that's some people actually outline their books and then just write them. And that sounds great. <laughs> I change my mind a lot. And I do usually have to know the dark moment. Mm, like the dark moment is, a, is what, and the grand gesture. Like I kind of have to have a sense for how they destroy everything and then how they fix it. But also that can like shift and change a little as I go in. Mm -hmm. There are plotters. There are people who plot a book and they just write them. So <laughs> organized. That sounds really novel. Yeah. What I am idea. not that person. I am the person that calls Sarah crying. <laughs> oh. I'm and insane. it's like, help me. <laughs> That's so sweet. So uh, before I let y'all go, when can we expect the next in these delightful series? Is there a date for the next Los Leones yet? Yes, it's next summer. Great. I think it's early June, and we have a title. It's uh, An Island Princess Starts a Scandal. Ooh. Yeah. Yay! I love that. And what about Hell's Bells? Those have been coming out September-ish. The end of August. End of my, August. That is my date. Okay. I will promise to hit it. Amazing. It will be Imogen's book. So yeah. Just pure chaos. I am ensues. so excited <laughs> for that for both of these. Thank you so much, y'all, for coming. This is really great. Thanks Take for coming. Care. Thank you.